We're joined today by David Patrikarakos. David, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. So your new book, War in 140 Characters, How Social Media is Reshaping Conflict in the 21st Century, has just launched. It talks about how social media has affected war, and it's based upon your experiences covering Ukraine, Israel and Gaza, and the Islamic State. So my first question for you is very straightforward. How has social media changed war today? How is it different than maybe, say, 20 years ago? Well, I mean, it's done so in a variety of ways. Um, I mean, first and foremost, it has enabled anyone with access to a smartphone to become an actor in war. Uh, what we are seeing now is a form of virtual war with mass enlistment in which anyone with a smartphone can take can uh, play a role. So, for example, if you are, uh, you know, someone in Gaza and an Israeli shell hits a building near you, you can take a picture of the dead bodies in that rubble and broadcast it to the world. Now, obviously, this has a real effect at the information level of war, because obviously dead bodies, dead children, civilian casualties are as old as war itself. The difference is you couldn't see them before. Or if you did see them, it was in you know far smaller numbers. Now, during a war, you can't escape them. The second thing is that it has allowed propaganda to be disseminated at speeds and at scopes that are unprecedented. Now, propaganda is as old as war itself. But with the changing nature of war, and it changed, propaganda has taken on a new role. And put simply, where once propaganda supported military operations on the ground, Increasingly, military operations on the ground are supporting information operations on TV and in cyberspace. Now, what do I mean by that? If you look at the classic Clausewitz, the famous uh, Prussian military theory said, war is the continuation of politics of other means. Now, I argue that actually war is becoming armed politics. Now, let's look at classic wars. Uh, usually in a classic war, two or more sides would fight. In an area that was as delineated almost as a boxing ring, the winner would then impose a political settlement on the loser. The classic example of this is the Treaty of Versailles after World War I. But this is no longer what is happening in war. Let's take Putin in Ukraine. Now, Putin and Russian aggression, Putin never had any intention of defeating Ukraine, which he easily could have done at the beginning, and forcing it to the negotiating table. No, what he did was he backed separatists, he sent in Russian forces to occupy parts of eastern Ukraine. But he did this in order to make it easier to sow a narrative. And the narrative, which I heard again and again and again during my time throughout the occupied territories, was that the Kiev government was a fascist junta and they wanted to persecute Russian speakers and destroy the speaking of Russian in Ukraine. In effect, he was trying to get Eastern Ukrainians to buy into a narrative, and that is a political goal. So, for example, when I spoke to soldiers that have served in Afghanistan, they told me that the goal became, in the end, not to militarily defeat the Taliban, but to convince the local population not to join them. And that's a political goal, not a military one. And Putin's goal in Ukraine is a political one. It's to destabilize the country by uh, sowing discord amongst its population. The goal in the and that is a political goal. It's not ultimately a military goal that seeks the defeat, the military defeat of Ukraine. And that is key. And social media is obviously at the heart of that. So how did social media and online propaganda seek to achieve that goal? Do you have some examples of that? Well, yeah, of course. I mean, I mean, look, take, for example, the, the, the downing of MH17 over eastern Ukraine by a missile we now know came from Russia. Um, you know, there was propaganda in action. You know, what happened, and I was in Ukraine when that happened, as soon as the missile, as soon as the plane was shot down, uh, you know, suddenly swarms of Kremlin accounts came on, you know, promulgating, you know, a variety of ludicrous narratives. The Ukrainians did it. The Americans did it. The Ukrainians and the Americans did it. But the goal, and this is what is also different, especially about Russian propaganda, you know, traditionally, Let's take, take Soviet propaganda. You know, its goal was to convince people that the USSR was the model society. It was the utopian dream realized on Earth. Modern Russian propaganda is not interested in that. It's not interested in portraying a positive vision of Russia. What it is interested in doing is sowing as much confusion and discord as it can so that there is so much misinformation that people's ability to recognize the truth when they see it is diminished. And that was the point of 
the all the propaganda around MH17. You know, the propaganda was successful not because of its content, which was ludicrous, but by its sheer volume, which drowned out, you know, a lot of the truth. So it's at the center of these information operations, which now are at the center of warfare. So these information operations have been getting a lot more attention recently. Probably the biggest social media related story right now is Russian attempts to use Twitter, Facebook to interfere in certain global political events, the US presidential election, um, Brexit, for example. Uh, and this is getting a ton of attention in the international media right now. But Ukraine has been experiencing this since at least 2014 and probably longer than that. How is, does the scope of Russian efforts to influence Ukraine, how does that compare to the situation in America or in Britain? Well, look, I mean, in Ukraine, it's obviously very difficult, because uh, very different, because there is a war going on. So, uh, you know, Russian information operations are in concert with a mu Russian, you know, military campaign. It's, you know, Maskirovka, I mean, you know, as I said, you know, they are destabilizing a part of the country that they have occupied. You know, however, you know, while maybe people aren't dying literally in Britain and the US, you know, they're having a huge scope. If it does turn out that, you know, those fake ads, those uh, the fake news swung, you know, I mean, they're saying reached 126 million people, which is pretty much the amount of people that voted in the US election. You know, if it can be said that they swung the election for Donald Trump, that is a very, very big deal. This is, you know, interfering in the election and getting elected uh, the single most powerful man on earth. I mean, it's a huge deal. And, you know, this is increasingly going to be the future. And it's very, very worrying in terms of conflict because social media was sold to us as another great utopian dream of a transnational connected world in which everyone would be brought together. Now, in a certain sense, it's true. We are connected. Uh, you know, I can speak to my friends in Ukraine on Facebook Messenger and we can talk instantly. Um, but at the same time, what social media has done it is it also drives people apart. And it does that in two different ways. The first is obvious. Platforms like Twitter and Facebook make it very easy for people to argue and have confrontation online, you know, vir in virtually face to face. You're not physically face to face, but you can seek out your, your opponents and you can argue and you see it on Twitter, which is a nasty place. You see people unfriending people on Facebook over political disagreements. The second way, and this is more insidious, is what we call homophily, which means literally love of the same, love of the like minded. So generally, when you're on Facebook, while people won't accord with all your views, your, your friends, inverted commas, are generally going to be largely speaking like you. It's unlikely, for example, you'd be friends with a load of Nazis or a load of jihadists. And they post content that more or less, you know, is, is at least within the realms of, of what you agree with. Even if, you know, they, you disagree on Brexit or you're a Democrat, they're a Republican, you're within the, you know, the normal parameters. The second thing is that the Facebook algorithm calculates content that you like and feeds you more of that content. Now, 20 years ago, um, you know, if two, you know, if, you, you know, when the US went into Iraq or Israel and Palestine had a war, both pro-Israelis and pro-Palestinians would have watched CNN or the BBC, you know, with their required standards of impartiality, journalistic standards and everything. They both would have watched the same footage. They might have drawn different conclusions, but they were watching properly produced, professionally produced journalism. Now, each side gets its information from its own preferred sources. And they literally, these sources, when you, when you cocoon yourself to such a degree, they construct your reality. And when all the sources that you see and read are only reaffirming your worldview, then division, then hatred, then even an ability to understand the other side's point of view becomes far, far harder. And thus is conflict, thus is hatred, and thus is war made far easier. And provoking that kind of conflict and hatred among people within one society is a topic that's been raised very frequently in coverage of the so-called Russian troll factory in St. Petersburg, the Internet Research Agency, which basically had people posing as Americans to spread memes and provoke the far left and the far right. Um, you, in your book, interview one former quote-unquote Russian troll, um, a paid employee of this Internet Research Agency, what are your takeaways from that? What is your impression of that agency and how well it functioned? Well, I mean, look, um, 
as uh, you know, the sort of eminent uh, scholar Mark Galliotti says, you know, we do have this impression, and I've you know quoted him before, of thinking you know Russians are all chess playing grandmasters, thinking twenty moves ahead. I mean, you know, the troll farm, while it was effective, you know, as Vitali, the the former member, was telling me, you know, a lot of the times it was just sheer stupidity. It was spamming. It was creating means, posting them to all sorts of sites that had nothing to do with politics. So, you know, many of their fake accounts would get shut down. So, you know, while it has an effect, the Russians are, you know, throwing everything but the kitchen sink at the problem. And if 20% of it sticks, they consider it a job good, a job well done. Unfortunately, if you're in a position where you can reach 126 million people, 20% is all you need. Mm -hmm. So uh, from your vantage point, having written this book, having covered this issue fair, in, in quite a bit of depth, what does the future of politics and the future of conflict look like to you? At the moment, very, very gloomy. More divisiveness, uh, more cocooning within our own echo chambers, greater divisions, greater conflicts, um, because one, you know, we have other tangential, pro tangential problems like depressed wages, uh, you know, high house prices, you know, you have a disenfranchised generation and what you have are social media platforms that amplify our existing divisions and make conflict easier. What is going to have to happen, and you're seeing this with the tech hearings now that recently happened in, in the US, is that the government is going to have to intervene at some form of the legislative leisure level to deal with social media. Too much, you know, free speech is sacrosanct, but too, there is too much hate speech. There is a clear difference between free speech and incitement to violence. One is legal, obviously, as it should be. The other is illegal. Too much of that is around. Something needs to be done because right now social media provide, um, is a serious threat to our information ecosystem. And unfortunately, until something is done, things are only going to get worse and they will get worse before they get better. Well, David, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you.